To confess that Jesus is the Christ in a room full of other people who are confessing the same thing is no hard thing. For anyone other than Jesus Christ to be compared to John the baptizer? What a thing to say about somebody. To say, well, perhaps this man is Elijah. Again, for anyone other than the Son of God, what a complimentary thing. So this says to us something about the popular opinion of Jesus' day, which was mostly what? Quite positive. We know the Pharisees hated him. We know they're trying to kill him. But the majority, Jesus isn't asking about the Pharisees' opinion. He's asking about the people's opinion. The majority of people's opinion is largely positive, but get this, it's positive based on a redefinition of who Jesus is. You see what they did? They redefined who Jesus is. They lowered Jesus down to the level of prophet, and having redefined him, reimagined him, they now give to him accolades. That's exactly what we've been doing for 2,000 years, isn't it? Do you know that the popular opinion of Jesus, if you were to, to say, what's, what's most people's opinion of Jesus? Do most people have a high opinion of Jesus or a low opinion of Jesus? Well, the answer to that question matters. And the answer to that question depends on what understanding you have of Jesus. The popular opinion of the Jesus that Scripture presents to us, which is the Jesus who says to us, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. The popular opinion of that Jesus has always been very low and always will be very low until the day that every knee bows to Him. But what most people do in our day, just like in Jesus' day, is they redefine him to be something less than what he is, still high and lofty. And having done that, they now have a high opinion of him. Do you know that every religion in the world has a high view of Jesus? Every religion. Islam, Buddhism, Confucianism, uh, the false religions of Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnesses, Seventh-day Adventists, Roman Catholics. They all have a high view of Jesus Christ after they've redefined him after they've made him to be something less than God incarnate, they then give to him high accolades. So we've been doing this for 2,000 years, folks. We've been taking the reality of Jesus Christ presented to us in the Scriptures, bringing it down to a level that we can manage, or to use a phrase that, you, that most of us will remember, taking him by force and making him king. Remember that? taking him by force and making him king, we now have a Jesus that everyone can celebrate. This reminds me of the words of C.S. Lewis. Most of us, maybe a lot of us, if you, if you haven't read Mere Christianity, you should. It's a great little book, 120 or so pages, well worth your time. But in Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis tackles this with the best words that it, I think anybody's ever written about this. Just to kind of read for a little quote from Mere Christianity in your notes here, it says this, I am trying here to prevent anyone from saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him, meaning Jesus, which is to say, I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great and moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level of the man with, who says he's a poached egg, there's his British humor there, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let, let us not come to him with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. We couldn't have said it better ourselves, couldn't we? Jesus did not leave the option open 
to revere him as some great teacher or some great man because Jesus repeatedly said the kind of things that either either would make him a madman, a lunatic, a devil from hell trying to deceive everyone, or the Son of God. Those are the only three options. And so this idea that, that we can admire Jesus after making him something a little different than what the Scriptures present him to be, the same thing that Jesus encounters here. Who do men say that I am? Now verse 29, but he asked them, but who do you say that I am? So in that verse there, the you is highly emphatic. If you want to, you can take your pen and you can underline you because that's how Mark wrote it. You yourself, you, that's who I'm asking now. You yourself, who do you say that I am? Now, if you want to furthermore mark up your Bible, which I like marking up my Bible, if you want to furthermore mark up your Bible, you can take your, your pen and you can draw an arrow from that phrase right up to verse 23, where Jesus asks the blind man, can you now see? Do you see? That's the parallel. Can you now see? Now he asks his disciples, who do you say that I am? Can you now see? Can you now see me? We've done the two feedings. We've done the calming of the sea. We've done the, uh, the speaking to the wind and the waves. I've opened the ears of the blind man. I have uh, opened, the eye, uh, opened the ears of the deaf man, opened the blind, blind man's eyes. We have done the whole thing through the, through the land of the Gentiles to fulfill that prophecy that out of the desert comes these living waters and you'll know that your God has come to you when the blind see and the deaf hear and the mute sing. So Jesus will now say, can you now see? Who do you now say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Christ. So that is the first time in Mark's gospel that his disciples have called him anything but teacher. You are the Christ. Now, this was not something that we should regard as maybe this spontaneous reaction that Jesus caught him off guard in this moment of euphoria And Peter, like Peter always does, sort of gets ahead of himself. His mouth gets ahead of his brain and he just sort of spouts out like a deer in the headlights. You are the Christ. That's not how we see this. Instead, we see this as the culmination of months and months of being with Jesus and experiencing his teaching, living with him, seeing him, being being followers of him. After months of this, this is now the culmination that Peter now says, you are the Christ. So this is a phenomenal declaration. As we know, we'll get into this in just a moment, this declaration that Peter makes is fraught with theological error that we'll sort of peel that back in just a few moments. But even setting that aside, even recognizing that, this is still a monumental declaration. You are the Christ. This is a phrase that is freighted with theological meaning. It's freighted with messianic meaning. And for Peter to declare, even in his faulty understanding, for him to declare, you are the Christ, this is indeed probably Peter's second greatest moment. Second only to perhaps Acts chapter 2, when he stands up before the crowd of Jews to say, you are the ones who are guilty of Christ's death. So this is perhaps his second greatest moment. But notice, first of all, the humility of Peter. We've noticed this before. In Mark's gospel, which Mark's gospel, once again, is the gospel, we could say, of Peter, because Peter is the one. It's it's like Mark and Peter are here beside one another, and they're, they're writing this together. And Mark is writing down Peter's experiences. And so Mark's gospel, which is the recollection of Peter's experiences, are it's always the gospel that shows the least positive light on Peter. The other Gospels, particularly Matthew and Luke, will always show Peter in a better light than does Mark's Gospel. And that's a reflection of the man's humility. So think about, for example, when when, uh, Peter gets out of the boat and walks on the water for a few steps. That's a pretty positive thing. No other person has ever done such a thing. And so it's a pretty, pretty positive accomplishment that Peter would trust Jesus in such a way to get out of the boat. That's left out of Mark's Gospel. Or uh, the declaration here that's before us. This, this, this really just shows us, I think, Peter's humility because the declaration that we're given here is simply, you are the Christ. Now, Luke's recording of this is fuller, but Matthew's recording of this is the fullest. And so in Matthew 16, Matthew records that Peter says, not only you are the Christ, 
But he goes on to say, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. To which Jesus will respond with those praises. We'll talk about in a little bit. Those praises that say, blessed are you, Simon Barjona. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I say to you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against this. Wow. Is anybody else in Scripture have that, that sort of thing said about them? That's quite a thing to have Jesus say about you. Now, we know the confusion, and, and Peter, you are this rock, and, and we know that Jesus is not saying, I'm going to build my church on Peter. But nevertheless... Peter is at the center of these accolades from Jesus. Yet when we come to Mark's gospel, it's as though Peter is looking over Mark's shoulder and Mark's saying, didn't you say more than that, Peter? I've heard that you said more than that. No, no, that's all we need, Peter. That's all we need, Mark. That's all we need. But, but didn't Jesus say, blessed are you? And didn't Jesus go on to talk about on this rock? And everything? We don't need to say that, Mark. They'll get the point with you are the Christ. Just leave it at that. You see the humility of the man? This man who has gone from the one who is full of pride and full of himself, now to one who shows the humility of a man whose character has been molded into the character of Christ. Peter's greatest area in his life in which his sin was most evident is also the area in his life in which the grace of Christ has been the most transformative. And that is a clear sign of the presence of the Holy Spirit. When the area of your life that in which sin was most dominant and most evident becomes the area of your life in which the grace of Christ and the transformation of Christ is also most evident, that's a clear sign of the work of the Holy Spirit. So notice we notice his humility here. Peter answered him, you are the Christ. So let's now think for just a few more minutes on this declaration, this declaration answer that he gives to Jesus. You are the Christ. And I want to just think through this declaration as problematic as, it, as we're going to see that it is, nevertheless, is also a very important teaching point, a very important model for us for true and genuine saving faith, for true confession of Christ. So first, let's think about the circumstance in which this confession was made. One of the most difficult things, I think, about studying the Gospels is getting the timeline. Because as we've noted many times before, none of the Gospel writers are particularly concerned with giving a chronological account. That's not to say that nothing in the Gospels is chronological. All of the Gospels will have, in fact, large sections that are chronological. But the overall picture is not a chronological picture. And that's not something that is exclusive to the writers of the Gospels, that was something that was common in the ancient world, that when you would write a biography or you'd write a story, you weren't particularly concerned about getting the chronology exactly right. You would just write the story as it seemed to fit the theme that you were teaching. And so the Gospel writers follow the same sort of thing. They are not concerned very highly at all with chronological accounts. And so oftentimes we find that the chronology between the Gospels is a little bit different and that can really cause us to, to struggle to get a good picture of what was the chronology of Jesus' life. So as we read this account, this seems to us to read as though that this declaration that Jesus is the Christ is going to come at a time in which Jesus' popularity is at its greatest. Doesn't it feel that way? Because we've talked about that over and over. The size of the crowds, the response to Jesus is at its height Jesus, here by the Sea of Galilee, there will be crowds that are so large that he'll need his disciples to get a boat, to have a boat ready just in case the crowd is going to crush him and he needs to get away from the crowd. The enthusiasm and the size of the crowds is tremendous. And here comes this declaration at the end of chapter 8. So it seems as though that this declaration occurs at the peak of Jesus' popularity. However, Jesus did not ask this declaration of Peter at the point at which his popularity was the greatest. Instead, Mark has reached into another section of Jesus' ministry and pulled from another time period of Jesus' ministry and brought that into this account because, again, as we've seen over and over, Mark is arranging stories to tell a point. And he has pulled this story from the section of Jesus' life that we know of as the latter part of John chapter 6. 
You're familiar with John chapter 6. In the latter part of John chapter 6, we're told that Jesus begins to teach hard things like you must eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink the blood of the Son of Man. If you do not eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you have no part of me. To which we are told in John 6 and verse 66 that people found that to be a hard teaching. And we're told that many people who were following him stopped following him at that point. You see, Jesus right now is not at the apex of his popularity. Jesus' popularity instead has waned. And the disciples have seen the crowds shrink. And the, the disciples have seen the enthusiasm cool to Jesus. Jesus doesn't ask Peter, who do you say I am? In the midst of the, the screaming, shouting crowds where Jesus has to raise his voice to even to be heard. Hey, Peter, who do you say I am? And all these people are cheering. Je yeah, Jesus, rah, rah, rah. Jesus asked Peter, who am I? At the very time in which Peter has been asked by Jesus, just recently, another question. You going to leave too? To which Peter says, we don't have anywhere to go. Because only you have the words of life. Shortly after that is when Jesus says, who do you say I am? You see, Peter's confession of Jesus has to be a confession that can be readily given when you're alone. To confess that Jesus is, a, is the Christ in a room full of other people who are confessing the same thing is no hard thing. But to confess that Jesus is the Christ when you've seen disillusionment, when you've seen the looks on people's faces as they begin to realize, oh, this guy just wasn't who we thought he was. This is not going where I thought this was going. Oh, well, I'm going back to fishing. I'm going back to farming. That's the only true confession. The, the confession that can be made in the face of the balloon that's going flat. And people seem to have lost interest and left and gone. You know what it's like to be part of something in which people were excited and enthusiastic and then all of a sudden things seem to be deflating and excitement tends, tends to have waned and you look around and you start asking, well, where did they go and where did they go? You know what that's like? I know what that's like. And you know what that's like too. Jesus knows what that's like. Peter knows what that's like. And it's only in that context Jesus waits to that time to say, Peter, who am I? Are you going to confess me to be the Christ only in the resounding cheers of the crowds? Or can you confess me to be the Christ when everyone appears to be abandoning me? When everyone appears to have figured out that I'm not who they thought I was. Because that's the only confession that can be genuine.